Welcome to episode 76 of The Geekly. My name is Jules. I'm Lex, and we're doing Card episode 8, Westworld season 2, and Devs episode 2 and 3. What did you make of this episode of Picard? Because it felt like finally, uh, we had a moment, I think, when we were watching Watchmen where we thought finally we're getting some answers and there was a huge bit of exposition. Um, the kind of, the larger story is kind of coming into focus now. Thousands of centuries ago, this race got to a very high level with their synthetic beings, but they evolved and they have put out this kind of psychic warning to anybody in the future that comes close to replicating their mistake with synthetics and 14 years ago people heard the call and so for 14 years the is it the Jean Jad Varsh or something I, I keep forgetting their something name something like that I, I can't like I, I don't know how to actually say the name but it's it's some sort of Romulan group of people yeah and so um, this um group they've been their sole mission has been taking out all synthetic beings this, this is probably one of the clumsier episodes of the season, I think. Like, the bits with Picard and Soji, like, that stuff was good. But everything with Rafi and Rios was just really heavy-handed, really clumsily done, and just, like, loads of exposition. I was really kind of disappointed with that because so much of the show is done really well that when they miss a beat or, or drop the ball, it's really glaringly obvious. I think you're right. I like the things that are happening with them, Soji. I like the things happening with Picard. The things happening with particularly Rios feel very, very convenient and very, very coincidental. We find out that um, Soji and um, Daj maybe aren't twins. Maybe they're part of like a larger group of synthetic beings. But the fact that he was on a ship with one of them previously it just feels like the biggest coincidence ever. Girardi said that the synthetics were always made in pairs and yet there appears to be three just like Soji, potentially more. So I don't know how they're going to resolve that if they've forgotten about that and are just making shit up as they go along. Again, like, how did Rafi suddenly know the whole story? Like, we, she was kind of talking to the different hollow incarnations of Rios and not really getting very far at piecing it together. And then all of a sudden she sit, they sit down and she knows the entire history of the synthetics and this, this group that's hunting them down and this eight star star system. And it just, it, yeah, it felt very convenient. What do you think of Jurati at the moment? Because every week it's kind of gone back and forward and the show wants us to see her as a victim because she was given this information about this, um, I can't, what was the name of it? The admonition, that's it. She was given yeah. the information about this huge thing that had happened in the past where synthetics had evolved and she described it as hell because Commodore O had given her all the information via, was it like Vulcan? Vulcan Mind Mel. Mind Mel, that's it, yeah. And so that was yeah. her reason for killing Maddox and uh, obviously she was meant to kill Soji. Then she finally takes this these drugs to kill the tracker. She's meant to kind of, we're meant to kind of believe that she's back on the team now and they're playing her off as his victim. I mean, what do you kind of make about, make of Jurati's story over the last th uh, two or three episodes? I'm not completely sold about it. Like when she killed Maddox, I was, I was intrigued. I was like, okay, this is, this is an interesting twist. I didn't really expect that from this character. She's obviously really broken up about it. I wonder how they're going to unravel this story. And then we got the scene with Commander O uh, doing the mind meld with her and it was kind of like all right maybe whatever she saw and felt was enough to kind of make her follow this belief but then like when she was talking to Picard she kept saying that that O had like poisoned her mind and left this poison in her mind that made it seem like she wasn't in control of her actions and I think I would rather her just kind of own up to it and be like yeah I did this and I thought I was doing the best thing instead of, you know, oh, I was forced into it and, and I was lied to and I didn't actually know what I was doing because it just, I don't know, again, it feels like a convenient twist and, like, they're trying to make us like her after she's done some horrible things. I mean, she's done some really, really terrible things. Yeah. She killed a guy. I mean, you, there's killing a guy and there's killing a guy as well, you know? I mean, yeah, she could have made right, it quick, before, but he was in agony. Yeah, I mean, like, his, his death wasn't this kind of, like, quiet slipping away thing like he suffered um in his final moments and I, d I don't think that was completely necessary she could have i'm surely they have technology now where you know you can kill somebody very quickly and easily yeah it's called a gun <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean they were in the medical bay like, 
<laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I just, yeah, there are there are many ways to quick something to kill someone quite quickly. Yeah, I just think the core concept of this episode kind of fell down for me because, you know, thousands of centuries ago they created synthetics. Fair enough. They evolved and ran riot. Fair enough. But time has moved on. Who's to say, you know, if if Neanderthal man or you know cavemen left the message for the future of the human race by saying but you know we created fire good god don't fall for that trap i mean it's terrible stuff i burnt my finger this is a message to all future generations do not create fire well we're in a kind of advanced civilization now and you know i think i don't know is it the 24th century i think i ask you every week i think so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I feel like if anybody's going to be quite capable of kind of dealing with synthetic life, even if it did evolve, it would be, you know, Starfleet and the Federation. I just, that, to the whole core concept of the episode, kind of doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. They obviously couldn't ask questions of this civilization, but I just think they were very quick to believe. And every time they kind of saw this flashback, it made me think of like Terminator Judgment Day, or it kind of made me think a bit of Westworld season two, but... I just think they could have been careful. They could have maybe gone into it with their eyes wide open thinking, okay, something bad did happen with synthetics and we just need to make absolutely sure. We need to have some fail safes to make sure this thing doesn't happen again. But I didn't buy it. The thing that I wonder, and I actually started wondering this as uh, I was watching Westworld this week, is why do they always make synthetics like super strong? <laughs> If they're terrified of synthetics kind of rebelling and uh, against humanity, why do they make them so much better and like so unstoppable compared to human beings? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. Like every, every single time that there's a synthetic in anything, any media, they're always like really super strong and can like fling human beings around and punch through walls and, and crush steel girders and shit like this. And I just kind of think, you know, if you're really concerned about an uprising, a, a machine uprising, don't make them so strong. Yeah. How many times do we see one of them get angry and you see the table they were sitting at and they were like handprints where they've kind of crushed yeah. the table? I mean, it's, it's such a cliche. It's, it's it, in every single iteration of some sort of synthetic AI life form, which is, yeah, even like Soji does it in this episode. She gets angry and like pounds the table. Yeah. And everybody kind of goes, oh legitimately i was waiting for a shot of like fist prints in the table and it never yeah. came fair enough but I, w- I was looking out for that i mean i'll pass it over to you we now know like the core concept of this season of tv as a kind of storyline i mean how how good is it th- this idea that everything has happened because of this uh, admonition and that's kind of what set all these um dominoes falling i mean what do you think of it it's kind of a very thin reasoning like i sort of I, I like the the kind of secret society out hunting down synthetics i like the whole question of, of whether synthetics have a right to exist whether they're people um again very similar to what's going on in westworld but but this idea that like three hundred thousand years ago a civilization created synthetics and they rebelled it reminds me an awful lot of battlestar galactica and the cylons it just i, I feel like we've been here before yeah, I think it was a bit similar to, was it the Kalon in the Orville as well? Yeah, it feels a bit overplayed. I think I would rather there wasn't a reason for the um, the Jard Vash to be doing what they're doing. They just decided that they preferred humanity. Yeah, I mean, Maybe it was a kind I don't of... I think they, they really need a complicated reason. Like, no. I mean, we come across it just in our everyday 21st century life, people who are absolutely terrified of technology and machinery and, like insist on living off the grid off the grid away from all of this stuff so like a particular group of people that's decided that ais are dangerous and and shouldn't exist like you really don't need a complicated backstory for that like you said in today's in modern day people don't need reasons for their hate of any kind of person unfortunately it's just they just take a dislike to people and i mean they could have maybe gave given it a better reason and i would have been more inclined to like it but the reason's so woolly that it's it's kind of undermined the season ever so slightly but i mean we'll have to see how it plays out we've got everybody rushing to this planet that bruce maddox was working at and was creating all of these uh, synthetic beings including soji and we'll have to see what what plays out all the is it all the romulan army are heading there at the moment yeah and, all um, the romulans are, are heading off 
seven of nine is back and she was briefly a borg queen which was kind of an awesome moment yeah i was gonna i was gonna talk to you about that maybe explain what what that means for to um, people such as me who have had no clue what she was doing (laughs) okay so um seven of nine is obviously a former borg she was reclaimed by voyager and kind of some of her implants were taken out. Some of them were impossible to take out. She's, she's kind of been in a process of regaining her humanity. So she got called to the Borg cube by the, the little thing, the little like dog tag that El... I can't remember his name. El, Elnor? Elnor, yeah. Elnor. She, she got called back by that the little dog tag that Hugh gave Elnor. And she saved his life and kind of took him along with her. She went to sort of like the command hub of the cube and basically turned it back on, turned all of its systems back on, which the Federation and the Romulans hadn't done because it's, it's very risky and dangerous because if a cube is on, it potentially can connect to other board cubes and call them and then the hive mind comes. On the board cube, we have like a shitload of board that haven't been reclaimed yet. They're, like, still in stasis, and they haven't been, like, converted from Borg to real individuals again. And then the, there were the reclaimed ones. They're no longer Borg, but they still have kind of some of the implants and stuff. And as they were in the, the command center, the, the lights of the reclaimed ones started going out as the Romulans were just killing all of them. It was just, like, mass genocide. Seven had said that she could plug herself into the cube and take control of all of the Borg and Stasis. And Elnor was like, yeah, let's do that. That's really cool. We'll have an army. And uh, she was kind of like, it's dangerous. I, I, I don't know if I can come back from it. I might like get sucked into it. But they were killing her Borg friends, so she got pissed off, plugged herself into the cube, became the queen of this micro-collective. And... Um, at that point, the Romulans released them all through the airlock, and it, it kind of went to naught. For, for a minute, I was worried they were going to kind of have her turn bad, and she was going to be a Borg queen forever, but she did disconnect herself. So hopefully at some point, she and Elnor rejoined Picard and, and his motley crew. Do you think the hive mind is on the way, even though it seems like she's kind of failed in her actions? Do you think somebody's going to meet the Romulans there? Because Picard and the motley crew heading to the planet, load of Romulans heading to the planet. I don't really see how it's going to play out. There would have to be like an army of synthetics there versus the Romulan army. And I would be very open to watching that. I think that would be an awesome battle. But uh, it feels like the some part of the Borg hive might have to turn up, surely? I don't think we'll get the, the Borg themselves. I think Seven will drive the ship to this planet. She's already started having the the cube rebuild itself so i think her goal with that because she said she was going to steal the cube so i think that's exactly what she intends to do and she's going to take it to that planet where everybody's kind of gathering around i also think there is kind of i think the planet is essentially populated by synthetics i don't think there are any organics living down there or if there are there are very few of them so you potentially have an entire army of synthetics on the ground and then you would have the Borg army that's in the micro collective that Seven can control. And I think that's kind of going to be how the battle plays out between those two groups and the Romulan army and potentially some Federation ships. Because didn't Picard order like a squadron or something? Yeah, the, a squadron was being sent to Deep Space 12, which they and Picard was supposed to rendezvous with them, but they're bypassing the space station and going directly to the planet so potentially some communication will go to the squadron and they'll divert and meet up at the planet i don't know but presumably the the federation squadron is going to come into play somehow because i don't see the point of writing it in just to have it completely forgotten about the next episode i'm hoping it's like one of those moments where you think all is lost like you know was it the battle of helm's deep and suddenly this whole squadron comes through yeah. yeah, I actually watched Guardians of the Galaxy uh, 1 yesterday and there's that moment where, um, well, when they're fighting against the Dark Aster and all of the little yellow ships come in to oh, join yeah, up with yeah, all the Ravager great. ships. That was pretty sweet. So yeah, I hope we get a moment like that. Um, that would be really cool. I know he hasn't been in this season, but it would be really cool if like Wesley Crusher was captaining his own ship now yeah. and he showed up, but I know he's not in this season or at least he hasn't mentioned that he's in Picard. 
I'd really like to see Cisco or Janeway. I don't know if that's possible, but um, I think they'd be quite cool to if they popped up. I think, like, like, isn't isn't Janeway an admiral? Now? I think she is. Yeah, because I think she was in the film we watched, but we haven't yeah. had any sign of her yet this season. But I'm I would really like to see her. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean that that would be pretty cool. Even like some of the Voyager crew on their own ships at this point. Like, I mean that would that would be pretty neat. Uh, Let's talk about devs, uh, episode two and episode three. Right off the top, I just want to say that the cinematography in this TV show is so beautiful and the kind of music that they have in the background of every scene. It makes it a really nice thing to watch. I don't know, it's kind of not like anything else on TV at the moment. It's a very relaxing kind of environment. Obviously, what's happening isn't so relaxing, but it's just really beautiful. It actually kind of reminds me a bit of the cinematography in Picard, like particularly the the opening sequence to Picard, that sort of like ethereal, dreamlike quality it has to it. I don't know what the word is, but it's a very satisfying sort of thing visually to look at. Yeah. Like it just kind of, it ticks one of those boxes that's like, yes, I like looking at this thing. I think there are some Twitter yeah. accounts that are called like aesthetically pleasing, you know, they'll be just perfect spirals in like the natural world or something like that. Yeah, um, there's um, a subreddit, Oddly Satisfying, which is like various things like that. And I, I would categorize the cinematography and devs as, as that. It's just it's very reassuring to look at, even though, as you said, what's happening is not very reassuring. Right, episode two, it kind of had two kind of sub-stories going on. And the first one was the fact that they break into the Sudoku app. They realised Sergei was a spy. And Lily makes the incredible decision to kind of not only communicate with but meet his handlers. And this the conversation she has with Anton is the first time where the idea of murder kind of enters her mind, as in Sergei's been murdered. You know, what do you kind of make of Lily so far as a character? You know, what what she... Is she doing anything for you? Not really. They haven't spent a lot of time developing her character. She is essentially Sergei's girlfriend, and that's yeah. it. Which is really unfortunate, because they've we're, we're at a really emotionally fraught moment in her life we should be kind of right in step with her and rooting for her and feeling the things that she's feeling and and trying to unravel this mystery about sergey but there's just this emotional disconnect like it is very much like watching somebody else go through the motions like i'm, I'm not really invested in, in her emotional well-being at all and i mean like you know we see shots of her crying here and shots of her crying there and you know there was that conversation with her mother and it, it kind of plays into a larger problem I'm having with devs where it feels very contrived and I'm not connecting with it. Do you think much like uh, a lot of the themes in this show a lot of the people come off of, as a bit mechanical a little bit robotic I think of Lily and I I don't she hasn't really conveyed much emotion she's very stoic she's quite reserved in many ways you know her boyfriend just died to her knowledge at this moment in a very terrible way and she's kind of you know embraced it fairly quickly i would have to say um that's just my take it's been kind of weird she's at work an awful lot like i I would imagine that under the circumstances she would kind of be in like mandatory leave she's having these deep conversations with her boss who's like the head of this major tech company the, the conversation between the two of them felt more like a direct supervisor might have with a direct subordinate or even a co-worker might have with another co-worker not the head of a major company would have with some random employee that they may not necessarily know about similarly the conversations she's had with kenton they also feel very intimate and it doesn't feel real yeah i mean that might be a good time to actually transition over to forest who even though he's, I can't say he's much more fleshed out than Lily at this point, but I find him incredibly intriguing. I find him quite hard to read because there is this malevolent side that he would just watch a guy being suffocated with a plastic bag. He also seems to be quite a broken individual. He had this very, like you said, this kind of heart to heart with a subordinate about, you know, his daughter and, the, and you know, loss and how you never really get over things. I mean, what, what do you kind of make of him? Because... Obviously, they've got this project going on in the devs building that we'll come on to in, in just a second. But it's it's difficult to know where he lies on the kind of, you know, the chaotic spectrum at the moment. Forrest's, like, lack of development doesn't really bug me so much. I was kind of okay with him being this sort of spectral figure yeah. in, 
in the background that we didn't really know much about. This kind of charismatic leader bit that we just kind of got bits and pieces from. Like like I said, I I didn't really buy the conversation with Lily. It seemed too intimate for these two characters. The thing with his daughter, it again, it feels very contrived. It feels very kind of convenient and shoehorned in, and and not overly creative. If I'm going to be completely honest. I mean, even the the kind of revelation about the project that Debs is actually working on is a very tired storyline. I guess is what I'm saying. Let's talk about that storyline. We see two of the techs. What do they call it? Minority Report, like just future viewing or something. Yeah. Yeah, they. I think they referred to it as a projection as well at one point, and. It's kind of out of the blue. They're in that, you know, the cathedral-like building we talked about last week. And all of a sudden, they're looking back 2,000 years and they've projected the crucifixion. We've talked about the choral music. We've talked about the fact that he seems like almost like a cult leader. We've talked about it looking looking like a cathedral. But they've now projected back and they've got this... They're viewing into the past and they're seeing the crucifixion. The show seems to be using quite a lot of religious uh, symbolism. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? I have really big problem with with media that tries to like slip in religious propaganda and i mean maybe it's unfair to call it propaganda that may that's that's probably too strong of a word i mean like you we have things like manifest where it's kind of like beating you over the head with it and this is kind of more subtle but the, the instant we had this vision of the crucifixion as a historic fact i felt betrayed by the story because it, I felt like it had presented itself as one thing and then it was trying to push this agenda that I wasn't really on board for. Yeah, I'm just I'm going to have a problem with anything that, that tries to put biblical stories as, as historic fact. And like when they did the little montage of, of the scenes that they had cast back, they all had religious significance to them. Like there was Joan of Arc, I think there was the, the Inquisition. I can't remember what all of them were, but they all kind of had these sort of religious overtones to them, which, I mean, in itself, most of them are actually historic things, like, you know, John of Arc was a real person, the Inquisition happened, that kind of thing. But given that it started with the crucifixion, it, it was an immediate turnoff for me. I was just like, no, I don't, I don't want to go down this road. I don't want to be in this sort of Christian doctrine-dominated storyline when I just wanted some good old-fashioned sci-fi. They've used words like uh, faith as well and they've used words like miracles and I think last week when he seemed like this prophet you know Nick Offerman's character Forrest I was kind of on board with that you know I like a bit of a cult leader type I think you you're, you enjoy yeah, a cult too. as well don't you? Cult leader story. Absolutely yeah and it's I do find it odd that they've kind of doubled down on it. Like I would have expected them to maintain what they started out with, but they've really leaned into the religious aspect of it. Let me just play devil's advocate for a second. Let's say, for instance, that what they viewed had absolutely no religious content at all. As an idea of looking back, even though, yeah, you know, Minority Report and other things have done it, it's not exactly overused, but we're all aware of it. I mean, what what do you what are your feelings about the fact that that's what Devs is working on? And I think it's episode three, which we'll come on to. Alison Pill says we only look back, suggesting that they actually have the ability to look forward. Um, and we kind of got um, a bit of a glimpse of that when we had some of Kenton and Anton's fight in the first minute of the episode, which we came back to. So, as a narrative device. And as a kind of sci-fi trope, give me your thoughts on the fact that they're they're going along this uh, future viewing. That's kind of seems to be the main the main gimmick of the the show. As a, a thing, this kind of like casting back and viewing moments of history in in a very sort of fuzzy, hazy, blurry sort of way. I I don't actually see the point, and I'm not sure why I should care about it. Like it just seems self indulgent because obviously, you know, Forrest just wants to go and, and look at scenes of his daughter and it has that feel of going back and watching old home videos. It just kind of feel like it's the same thing and the fact that he's got this whole secret project going and all of these technicians and coders and stuff working on this super top secret project that is essentially just to allow him to look back into the past at moments of his dead daughter's life. It feels like an incredible waste of resources and I can't believe that these people are actually on board with it. I mean, like, what, what is the point of being able to look back into the past? I, I don't get it. I think the fact that they are, I'm hoping they're refining it by looking backwards so that they've perfected it by the time they're looking forwards. Um, I think that's most likely the direction they're going to go with it. 
Did you want to talk about the Kent on an <laughs> the Kent on an Anton fight? Okay, yeah. The, the, this was sort of the second moment that lost me. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, we we had definitely different readings of this, so we'll we'll go through them one by one. Uh, talk to me about the Kent on and Anton fight. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go back to to when Anton and Lily were talking, and Kenton is essentially just sort of like around the corner from them, smoking while they're talking he's not even like out of sight he's just right he can probably hear them he wouldn't he wouldn't have needed to bug them he could probably just hear them with his ears yeah, like he hear what they're talking about. standing there listening to the conversation there's there's this building lily and anton are on one side and kenton is literally just around the corner smoking and and just like anybody who's been anywhere near cigarettes knows that like you can smell them and there's a very distinct smell when they're nearby and they're fresh and i sort of just feel like this russian spy guy would be aware of this and would kind of cop on to the fact that he was being followed by this kind of middle-aged tech guy then we get to the confrontation and anton looks genuinely surprised that kenton has like supposedly come out of nowhere and again i feel like a russian intelligence agent would know when he's being followed like that kind of seems the bare minimum skills for a spy to have then there, there's the age disparity and the fitness disparity. I would say that Anton is a good 20 years younger than Kenton. Kenton obviously has a gut. He's not quite as fit as Anton. Beyond the fact that at that age, the, that 20-year gap makes a huge, huge difference in terms of physical ability. And I just, like, as they were fighting and as they were struggling, before we got to kind of like the end of the fight, I was a little bit surprised that Anton stabbed Kenton just kind of like out of nowhere. I was like, okay, that, that was unexpected, but... I'll go with it. They're struggling a little bit. Kenton puts up more of a struggle than he expected. They end up on the ground. I I pretty much knew, because the actor's very familiar face, that Kenton was going to come out of it alive, and I was just watching this play out thinking, if he lives, that's it. I'm done. Because I just did not buy that he could outmaneuver and outfight this intelligence agent that was in better shape and younger than him and you know he's he's the security the head of security who sits behind a desk most of the time yeah i think you taught me something about myself yesterday because i think i'm very bad at aging people <laughs> um by looking at them when i when i watched this scene i just thought to myself okay we got like probably ex cia who's now private security we've got ex kgb who's now you know in charge of hacking america i just i saw them as contemporaries Thinking about it, I did recognise Kenton. I didn't recognise Anton, but Kenton is the boss in Fight Club. Uh, Fight Club came out a very long time ago. <laughs> so I probably should have had a better idea that he was a bit older than Anton. But I, I did enjoy it. And, you know, Anton was never going to kill Kenton in that situation because I think Kenton's here for the long haul. But I did in, I did enjoy that scrap. I just I assumed they'd be, you know, going up against each other the whole season. Like, I thought they would be, like, adversaries in a way. Um, and I did enjoy the neck break, but I think I would have to concede um, after our kind of conversation on WhatsApp last night. I think you're probably, I think I think the truth is probably somewhere between our two opinions. But I, yeah, I think I've probably got to concede towards you. Um, but that that neck snap, I, I enjoy. Mean, as far as ways to kill people, that that was a pretty creative. It was. It was. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anybody kill another character in quite in in that way before. So I mean props to the team for coming up with that but I just just overall I think yeah if they'd spent the season kind of trying to outmaneuver each other and it was a more psychological game I would have been more on board with Kenton kind of potentially gaining the upper hand now and then but in a purely physical fight it's just no I'm not buying it yeah okay let's move on to episode three I think kind of a key plot point developed here the idea that the government wants to weaponize Forrest's technology. He described it as we're using qu- a quantum system to create a prediction algorithm. It feels like every bit of tech in every film at the moment wants to be, you know, somebody wants to weaponize it. So he's very resistant to that. But the main part of that episode was the fact that Lily and her friend kind of conspired to get into Kenton's office so that they could steal the footage of Sergei's self-immolation. I mean, I thought that was probably the best bit of acting by the actress who plays Lily kind of selling this emotional breakdown in Kenton's office and then you know standing out on the balcony as if she was going to commit suicide the fact that they got the video of uh, Sir Guy's um, self-immolation she showed it to Jamie and the fact that uh, the bit that 
because I quite liked episode two, but episode three was my was where I had the problems. But you've got to remember that Davis is full of tech people. Top to bottom, it's going to have some of the best minds in all of America who could, you know, doctor video. And she brings this video to Jamie, they watch it together, and he in like two seconds can see that there is fire, you know, flickering in the same way, and it's VFX. And so that kind of was beyond a bit beyond belief for me. I like the means by which they got the video. It was quite creative, quite fun. But it just seemed so convenient to me that they would do such a bad job of faking Sir Guy's suicide. Episode three was kind of strikes three and four for me. One, which is, since you brought it up, the, the relationship with Jamie, he seems suddenly very okay with Lily. They're, they're supporting each other. They're hugging each other. It's, it's like you said, it's convenient. You know, you want to sit here and watch your boyfriend set himself on fire with me. Sure, yeah. I mean, he said that it was uh, transcendentally weird, which I thought was a great line. Then it just cut, and they're, they're suddenly watching it. And it just, I was sitting there thinking, like, these people have so much unresolved shit that they're being way too friendly with each other, way too casual. We also don't really know that much about Jamie and what his skills are. And like, like you mentioned, why does she go to him? Is it just because he's outside the company and she doesn't trust anybody inside the company? Does he actually have some special skill that is like above and beyond what her other friends have? Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's just convenient that she has this person that she can go to who's suddenly like, super supportive and on her side. I feel like her and Jamie are going to sleep together within the next two episodes and then they're going to end up together at the end of the season i don't know about you but oh yeah i'm, t- I'm definitely predicting that so yeah the the heist between her and her friend this was a moment where i feel like they tried to fake us out with some very ham-fisted pseudo psychology and make us kind of think that lily was going crazy or that she might be going crazy and, and sort of distrust her but it was just done so poorly and so kind of haphazardly you know they started throwing out i mean as soon as her friend said oh yeah i think she's schizophrenic i was that was it i was just like no i'm done i know a lot about mental illness and when they present mental illnesses specifically schizophrenia like inaccurately it's just kind of a major turnoff Watching a lot of sci-fi, I know that you kind of have to... I mean, I watch primarily sci-fi and fantasy, so there's a little bit of you know suspension of disbelief all along. If the science and the logic is so flawed, I just can't stay on board anymore. And I think it would have been much better for them to show us that her and her friend planned this heist and just to have it like that so that we were in on the joke rather than you know going through this whole sort of subterfuge and at the end having the scene in the car which i also thought went on for way too long and they were laughing and celebrating and like oh my god we we did this amazing thing and when the big reveal kind of came that her friend i think her name's jen was really trying to steal the the files i i felt a bit betrayed for the third time in these two episodes. Let's talk about Devs as a whole then. Um, I'm not that bothered by um, the Lily story, but I am weirdly intrigued by the idea of, you know, the future viewing, looking the, these projections to the past. I, I'm curious to see what plays out with that, but that's not a TV show. It, you couldn't really have a show focused around Forrest and him dealing badly with the loss of his daughter. And presumably he's going to keep viewing her. He's going to keep not letting go. Uh, and eventually the government are going to try and take his tech. I want the show that I feel like the first episode promised us in this this kind of creepy, almost cultish environment with a very charismatic leader and kind of mysterious conspiracy type things happening with this tech. And I, I just feel like in episode two and three, it's it's completely gone off the rails. Okay, let's finish with uh, Westworld Season 2. I'm going to get my grievances out of the way first. I've got to be honest, it's a lot easier to understand and it's a much better watch when you binge it. But as much as, you know, last week I said if somebody asked me about some kind of entry-level sci-fi, I might recommend Westworld Series 1 to them. I honestly don't know if I'd recommend Westworld Series 2 to anyone, sci-fi lovers or not. During this season, we've got the Dolores storyline, the Maeve storyline, Ed Harris's Williams storyline, the Bernard storyline, and they all take place over the space of two weeks. 
William's daughter Emily is woven in there as well. You've got Akacheta, this Native American host, his story is kind of woven in there as well. They all take place over two weeks, but Bernard's storyline starts at the beginning of the two weeks and in the middle of the two weeks. And so his storyline ends in the middle and at the end. You've also got uh, Logan, a storyline with him, you know, as he's getting the demonstration, kind of think this is even before season one took place. Then you've also got these scenes of between when Jimmy Simpson's William leaves the park in 2022, between that point and when Ed Harris's William goes into the park in 2052. So you've got all these storylines being told. And if you can imagine, you know, back when this originally came out, it was weekly and sometimes the storyline might not even continue in the next episode. It might continue in the following episode. And I just think in general, this is a TV show where it was overly complicated. You know, I don't like watching TV with paper and pen, but half the time I kind of thought, like, I cannot remember what Bernard was doing before his time jump forward or backwards a week. I believe this show in general wants to kind of disorientate you. We had some of that in season one where the Dolores storyline, we didn't know necessarily the entire time that it was taking place in two separate periods with the same guy. But I think there's a difference between disorientation and alienation. And I just think to use the, you know, I'm studying a film PhD at the moment. I don't want to lose anyone with this technical term, but I believe the show um, disappeared up its own ass. I, I don't know how you fix it, though. I'd probably remove the Akachetta storyline. I'd probably simplify the, Bern the Bernard storyline. I don't know if I would have necessarily all of the William engaging with, um, is it James Delos? That yeah. storyline. I just, I don't know. I don't know how you simplify it, though. I just think they've taken on a little bit too much. And I just think, as in general, this is just overly complicated. It looks great and it sounds great. I'll be honest, it was 10 times better binging it. You know, you could actually remember what happened in the previous episode when you'd watched like four in a row. You've got to give the fans a bit of a chance. I did not feel the same way. First of all, like my favourite episode was episode eight, which was the was Akichata's storyline. I okay. really liked the pacing of it. Um, I, I really liked his whole story and, and him his kind of journey coming to awareness. Um, it was probably my, yeah, it was definitely my favorite episode of the entire season. I could have watched a lot more about his story. I think the actor did a brilliant job in, in conveying a lot of complex emotions and doing a lot with very little verbal dialogue, just like his face and his movement and stuff like that. Um, I found the, the relationship between him and Maeve's daughter to be very interesting and, and kind of how he, he sort of adopted her and took her under his wing and you know, when he was telling her the story, he was also speaking to Maeve, even though it wasn't made completely clear until the end of the episode. I thought that was a really kind of cool effect that he was aware that Maeve was sort of tapped into her daughter and also hearing what he had to say. And so he was he was addressing both of them at the same time. Maeve's storyline, again, was, was my favorite. I think unquestionably the strongest character in the show, the most relatable, the most empathetic. She is 100 percent a badass but she's also very nurturing very compassionate she kind of you know is the whole package and i love the moment where like she comes out and the the kind of half-formed buffalo take out the security guys and and she's just standing there and says you know you took too long so i just saved myself and, like i think that is kind of a quintessentially mave moment yeah i just i really love her and really love her development and and everything she went through the dolores storyline i did not care for. I, every time it came on, I was just like, I'm kind of done with this. She was basically just bent on destroying everyone and everything, and I wasn't that interested in an entire season of that, especially since she always succeeded and she never went unchecked. Like, every time she came up against some sort of conflict, she just wiped them out completely. Whereas, like, in Maeve's storyline, they had failures and they had successes and, and they struggled a bit and, and it wasn't so easy for them to just wipe everything out. Whereas Dolores felt like, you know, she was completely unstoppable. And, yeah, I, I just wasn't really into it that much. Bernard's storyline is probably the most confusing and problematic and what made the season seem really disjointed because you actually have two storylines for Bernard. You have the kind of present day one and then what happened two weeks ago and they sort of overlap and I found myself being kind of confused at various points about what was happening when and not in an interesting intriguing way and I don't know what the fuck is going on way again he's kind of one of the least interesting characters I mean 
for the most part, he just sort of hangs out on the edges of scenes while other characters do things, and it's not that interesting. Like, I, why, why should I care about Bernard? So yeah, I think probably the best way to simplify it would be to, like, cut back Dolores, cut back Bernard, have Maeve be the central storyline, maybe weave in a, a little bit more of Rakachata, like, through the whole season rather than just having it dumped in one big episode. More Ed Harris, less young William. I, I didn't really feel like the William scenes brought anything to the table. It was just kind of anecdotal and like it, it wasn't really informative or necessary. Whereas Ed Harris's portrayal of, of the man in black, you got to see somebody sort of descend into their own madness. And, you know, the moment, I think, like, well, before Akachata saved him and he got shot, like, four or five times. I don't know how he survived, but he did. Um, I was actually kind of upset that he might be killed off so soon, um, because as as unlikable as he is as a character, he made a really great antagonist in the story, and I was really interested in in seeing what he did and how he interacted with the hosts and what he was going to do next. And, And the moment when he actually shot his daughter and she's standing there saying, like, these are real people, what is wrong with you? It just kind of, like, really epitomized how detached from reality he'd become because of his obsession with Westworld. You've said so much great stuff there. I want to come back to it kind of one by one. The Man in Black. There was a point during this season where I kind of thought to myself, is he on a path to redemption? Because he'd previously killed Lawrence's wife. And then in this playthrough, he saves her life. And the moment where he killed his daughter, we assume that it is actually his daughter, but we never saw, you know, the reading on her scan. And I can't imagine the kind of mindscape he's in right now, moving forward, because it feels like they teased us with a bit of white hat, but now he's just pure, pure, unredeemable black hats moving forward. They, they also teased us a bit with possibility that he's not actually human which i found interesting and i'd be really curious to see how that develops in season three like is is he a host is he a guest um because we just saw him kind of like digging in his arm and we didn't really get any conclusion one way or the other like whether he was a host or a guest i wanted to talk to you about that actually because we talk about the lateral palm slice but i feel like this is an this is another trope in itself it's the questioning my own reality arm dig because we've seen that in something else recently as well. I can't remember what it was, but people seem to like to take a knife themselves in a mirror and just check if they're real or not. Um, but that was that was fascinating. That's a very good point that you just brought up. Like what you said with Dolores as well. I completely agree with you. When she got to the very end and, you know, the hosts were being promised this kind of heaven-like um, world. And she was like, oh, it's just another lie that the guests want us to believe. You know, the only true world is your real world. She didn't ever seem to be content with anything. Um, And she obviously turned Teddy into like a pure killing machine and then he killed himself. And she again, much like um, William moving forward, there's like this unredeemable nature to her. And I just, I don't really care for her story. She's just going to be a tyrant, it seems. And that's a bit, a bit boring. Yeah, I'm... I mean, I, that was definitely how I felt about her. I mean, I found it interesting that she kept Bernard alive knowing that he would try to stop her. I don't really feel like he's an adequate opponent for her. Like, I don't think he can compete on her level. So it just sort of feels like another situation where he's going to fail and she's going to wipe the board with everybody. But like, um, going back to what you said about her or not being satisfied with anything. Every time she cut, you know, she wasn't satisfied with Westworld, so she was trying to get to was it the Valley of Death? The Valley Beyond, I think they called it. The Valley Beyond. And she was really, really focused on getting there, and then they would be free, and then they would, you know, be able to live their lives. But then she got there, and she wasn't happy with it, and it became, well, now I have to get into your world. Nothing you've given us is enough. And and Bernard even said, what do you mean it's not good enough? You can make that world anything you want it to be. You have unlimited power, unlimited control. You can be anything you want. And she was like, no, we, we have to go into your world. And I was just thinking, like, how satisfied is she going to be once she gets there? The bit I don't agree with you is, um, I guess, well, the Akachetta storyline. It seemed that his episode was about realising his consciousness, kind of like Dolores did in season one. And I just didn't really understand why we needed to see another host achieve consciousness where that idea had kind of been given to us in season one. I, I appreciate, like like you said, he was ve- he acted very well. And it was, lo- it was lovely to see like a brand new aesthetic when I saw the Raj for the first time this season, 
lovely to see a new part of the park, a new aesthetic. I felt the same with Shogun World, which we'll talk about in a minute when we talk more about Maeve's uh, storyline. Obviously, he was the main driving force behind finding the door and taking these people to like the promised land, you know, of this new world. But it just felt like same old, same old from season one, really. If, if I'm being, you know, if I'm being critical. Where I stand is I would rather have had his story than Dolores' story. Should we talk a little bit about the other worlds that we've... Because it's, it's not just Westworld. We, we both thought Maeve's was the best storyline, so that's probably a good place to start, actually, Shogun World. I, <laughs> I thought it was so funny that um, Lee Sizemore had basically ripped the load of um, storylines and characters from Westworld to put them into Shogun yeah, and, World. And Maeve calls him on it. Like, you plagiarised us. Seeing them all kind of come together was such a surreal moment and it was fantastic to see Sweetwater given this kind of Shogun World twist um, and all the music that we'd come to know being played on the piano given that kind of twist as well. It seemed like it wasn't as tame as Westworld as well because you'd obviously have to use swords rather than guns. Guns have this, you know, point and shoot and the job's kind of done. Yeah, I think Maeve was the kind of star of this season. And it was interesting when Ford actually said to her, you know, you were my favourite creation. I found that interesting as well. And I think they could have set it up a bit more in season one. Because, I mean, obviously we got the, the hint that she'd actually been programmed to escape. And then she kind of fought against her programming in, in the end. But we weren't really given any insight into why she was his favourite. I mean, what did you think about, just as a concept, the quest for the Valley Beyond and this kind of heaven for the hosts? I, I thought it was just such a brilliant idea. It was kind of at odds with a lot of other stuff that was happening. But looking at this door just open up, it looked like a crack in reality. And they all had to climb this little ramp and like throw themselves through it. And their minds would go into the world. Their bodies would kind of drop down below. I just thought that was really, really interesting. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it. It was kind of an extension of the mythology we got a glimpse of in season one where they, they talked about the, the world below and the, I, f I forget exactly what they called the, the techs in their weird suits, but they, they had like dolls and drawings and figures of what the techs looked like in, in their suits, kind of like alien-like creatures. And I really liked the idea that, that the hosts had sort of developed their own myths and legends kind of separate from what they've been programmed to do another kind of indication that they'd achieved consciousness independent from their creator's intentions really enjoyed that aspect of it what did you think of the idea about uh, delos you know scanning guests with the idea of learning how to back up the human mind i mean it's kind of interesting but at the same time it's also where synthetic bodies always go yeah like how can we achieve immortality? And yes, you know, humans are always trying to achieve immortality. I mean, I did find it interesting that they, when they tried to make the human mind complex, it failed. But when they pared it down to, I think it was like 240 lines of code, it actually worked. So it wasn't kind of that, you know, when they were trying to do this absolutely faithful rendering of the human consciousness, they couldn't replicate it. But when they stripped it down and just made it very simplistic, it worked. And you people couldn't tell the difference between that version and the real version, which was sort of a twist on the, you know, we're not as complicated as we think we are, which isn't usually discussed in, in any kind of media. There's always this idea that, you know, humans are the, the best and the top, and, you know, even our emotional turbulence is, is unique and special and serves this great function. Like, you see that a lot in Star Trek with the humans versus the Vulcans and, and things like that. So it was it was sort of interesting to, and and humbling to be told, yeah, when we uh, when we just reduced it down to two hundred and forty lines of code, then it worked. Considering this season as a whole, I mean, I remember at the end of season one thinking, wow, like you know, this was a real strong first step in a brand new franchise, and I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing you know how far it goes. Having watched season two, I just feel like I'm slightly alienated by it. I don't entirely know what's coming next, except the season will take place in the real world. I'm less enthused, if, if I'm being completely honest. I, th I feel like the show's built around Dolores's whole journey and her politics and her ideals that, you know, she wants to take over our world. And I'm not really interested in that, I don't think. When I started the show back at the very beginning, I was curious to kind of see all of the parks 
you know, to see what storylines were out there and see how maybe there might be crossover from park to park. Like, you know, Westworld, you know, the Cowboys might go up against the Shogun, you know, something kind of very aesthetically pleasing, very kind of sci-fi, very interesting, very like genre fiction heavy, but that might have been quite fun, you know, if they'd all achieved consciousness and they were making their own decisions. But I don't know how this story ends and I'm not, I don't know, I'm kind of a bit lost really. For me, I felt like the stories were resolved. <laughs> like, I, I don't... After season one or after season two? After season two. Yeah. Like, a, a lot of the loose ends were tied up, and I don't really see where they can go from here, except, as you said, to do kind of Dolores trying to wipe out humanity. And again, that's a very tired storyline. I'm, I'm really... We're, we're dealing with it in Picard, dealt with it in, in other sci-fi shows where the, the AI consciousness turns evil and gets rid of the, the human population, and I don't see how they can do anything new with that. So I'm, I'm not super enthused for seeing more Dolores trying to conquer the world, because, I mean, we've, we've had two full seasons of that so far. Well, I mean, season one was a bit different in that she was kind of discovering herself, and, and we were realizing that she was actually the agent, she was Wyatt, and, and the villain of the world. But, like, this whole season was Dolores trying to conquer the world, and she did it. So we don't really need to see her conquer the world again. Do you know what was really interesting to me, actually, during parts of season two? I doubt anybody in the world had this take, but when she was walking along and she was often flanked by um, cowboys or the, the desperados that she kind of acquired at that fort, I got this real strong feeling and this real strong resemblance to Darth Vader. <laughs> She she had this, you know, this way. She would just plough forward. She was flanked by these people and she would just be bringing, like, death and destruction wherever she went. I, I'm interested to maybe to see who she comes up against. Who is her opposition? Obviously, Bernard, we know, but I don't know how he's going to recruit people. I assume Dolores is going to do a lot of recruiting. I just don't know really what to make of season three but we'll we'll give it a go and we'll see what happens and as i would recommend season one to anybody i can't in all good faith recommend this season to anyone like i, I don't know who i would recommend this to other than the most hardcore sci-fi fans and there was something i actually meant to say when we were watching picard which i thought was quite interesting you've kind of picked up on it do you remember um, Daisy Johnson from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? She was referred to as the uh, Destroyer of Worlds. Yeah. And do you remember Raven from Titans? She was also referred to as the Destroyer or the Destroyer of Worlds. And when we're watching Picard, she refers so to... Destroyer. Yeah, yeah, she refers to Soji as the Destroyer. Dolores now, again, feels... She hasn't been called it by name, but she now feels like... She's the, the Deathbringer. Yeah, this just feels like I've seen it before and my, my Westworld interest has kind of gone off a cliff after watching season two, which makes me sad. But um, yeah, people are talking about season three feeling like almost a reboot, feeling like a different show. So we'll have to see what we make of it. In terms of, of who I would recommend this season to, I would probably say philosophers or anybody who's sort of interested in the in concepts of, of identity and reality versus fiction and and like what is real so, i mean that that comes up a few times and the thing that that sort of stuck me it's it's it only it's only mentioned twice one in the the first episode and then again in the last episode i believe either the ninth or tenth episode it said that what is real is that which is irreplaceable and i've kind of been like pondering this for several days because a lot of things are replaceable. So how do we really differentiate what is real and what is not? In the end, at the end of season two, what is the difference between the hosts and the guests? Like, we've, we've gotten to a point where the artificial and the, the organic have kind of merged and the lines have been blurred. So I would be really interested, in, and I hope that they explore that concept a bit more in season three, and, and I really want to see more of Maeve. They can kill off Dolores, and I won't feel bad the least little bit, <laughs> um, and I would like some more of the man in black. Okay, well, let's wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope everybody's washing their hands and staying safe. Uh, we will be back next week. Uh, we might try and do some shorter, more frequent episodes. We're not sure what to do during this isolation period, but um, we will be back experiment a little bit so yeah stay safe social distancing people see you soon bye